Welcome to Meet Your PJ, a production of the New York State Judicial Institute. I'm John Carr, Senior Advisor for Strategic and Technical Communications. In this series, we'll introduce you to the four judges who run the appellate divisions in New York State, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth departments. Today, we'll start with the first department in Manhattan and the Honorable Rolando T. Acosta. Justice Acosta emigrated from the Dominican Republic at the age of 14 and graduated from Columbia College, where his exploits as a pitcher on the baseball team earned him a spot in the Columbia University Athletics Hall of Fame. He then went on to Columbia Law School. Justice Acosta held a number of positions with Legal Aid Society and the New York City Commission on Human Rights before his election to the New York County Civil Court judgeship in 1987. He was elected to the Supreme Court in 2002 and promoted to the Appellate Division in 2008 by Governor Elliot Spitzer. He was named Presiding Justice in May 2017 by Governor Andrew M. Cuomo. Judge, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, let's first discuss, if we could, your background and then uh, chat about the, uh, the court. Um, why did you emigrate? How did you end up in the United States? Uh, well, thank you for having me, John. I, I, you know, I immigrated with my family uh, for the same reasons that all immigrants do. Uh, basically, an opportunity to advance in a way that basically we could not advance in the Dominican Republic, my native country. Uh, my parents did not think that, frankly, that they could provide sufficiently, whether educationally uh, or financially, uh, for us to have a better life uh, than they did. So they immigrated to this wonderful land of uh, milk and honey where basically we're an immigrant willing to work hard, at least got a shot at success of making their life better. So, Did, did you or your family encounter any particular racial difficulties or hostility uh, when you were growing up in the Bronx? Not really. You know, we, we encounter the same issues most immigrants uh, have encountered throughout history. You know, you always, if you're the new kid in the block, uh, you get picked on. <laughs> That's universal, right? Uh, but, but the process of, of acculturation, uh, of accul basically acculturating to New York was made easier by so many people that were part of, you know, that tough urban environment in the South Bronx in 1969 when I arrived. Uh, so it was rough, uh, but it was filled with folks uh, willing to help uh, and share uh, with the newcomers uh, the basics of living in, a, in an urban environment uh, with very little uh, financial wherewithal. Who were your early um, role, model, role models or mentors? Uh, you know, my... My father and mother always mentored to me, uh, particularly uh, my father. O -o although, you know, they had a rough life, uh, mostly in poverty, uh, they invested significantly in, in their six children uh, and sacrificed so much um, uh, in a way that, frankly, not many would have, um, putting their needs uh, and wants second uh, to all of the wishes and needs uh, of their children. Uh, in high school, in high school, my influential figure was uh, my English as a second language uh, teacher. Uh, his name was uh, Mr. Palace. Uh, although I didn't quite appreciate it then, he, he was one of those who pushed me very, very hard to bear down and complete the arduous work of, of not just learning a language, uh, but learning the culture and creating uh, the foundation for an immigrant to be successful in New York. Uh, he's now retired in Florida. Uh, you know, when I was appointed uh, presiding justice, he was one of the first people that I called to thank. Uh, li like most great teachers, uh, Mr. Palace um, was somewhat surprised that, that uh, forcing me to complete my work before releasing me uh, to play baseball was in fact appreciated by me. Of course, I let him know, uh, you know, that I didn't appreciate it then because as a youngster, all you want to do is play ball. Who wants to do English homework, right, and learn that tough language? Uh, so, but, but I certainly appreciate it now. I know the impact 
that he had in my life. Well, you clearly did more than play ball at DeWitt Clinton. You graduated fourth in the class of 1,000. So obviously you, did, you were able to master English as a second language. I, I, I did. You know, I, I, I was uh, in the college-bound uh, program at Clinton. You know, I had Mr. Palace, but I also had others that invested a great deal of time on my success. Uh, you know, you take one Mr. Kintish, who, who aside from being the vice principal at Clinton, was also the track coach at Columbia. Uh, th those were tough years at Clinton because doing well academically uh, for someone with very little knowledge of English and, and the culture required a, a great deal of, of work and sacrifice. You know, it meant, you know, working in a supermarket while studying uh, and playing baseball and soccer and, you know, learning a new language and a new culture. Hmm. Now, uh, DeWitt Clinton at, at that point was still an all-boys school, wasn't it? I, it, it was. It was. Uh, my, my class alone was a, <laughs> a thousand and six kids. You know, the, 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 all boys at that time. So that you know, there were about four thousand uh, in uh, in the entire uh, four years um, or, or four classes uh, at Clinton. Hmm. Now, with your academic and the athletic prowess. You were courted by uh, a number of schools, including Harvard and Princeton, and turned them down to go to Columbia. Why? <laughs> you know, I get asked that question often, you know. I, you know, my, my father always emphasized education. You know, he knew that, that given the career longevity uh, of baseball players, I mean, remember in the old days, you were 30 years old, you were already over the hill, you know, you were not a youngster. Uh, so, you know, my father knew that in, in you know, I wasn't quite convinced in those days because as a kid, you always want to play baseball. But, you know, he turned out to be right and I made the, the right choice to follow his advice that, you know, getting an Ivy League degree or two uh, will be really uh, helpful. Of course, again, he was right. Uh, it doesn't seem, however, that that uh, they aren't. It, it doesn't mean that they aren't those days when I see a pitcher with a subpar record, and I don't think you know I can do better than that <laughs> for the <laughs> ten or twenty millions that they get in paid. <laughs> now, um, were you always thinking law school as, a, as an undergraduate? Was that always the plan? Um, not, not really. Uh, you know, originally, uh, you know, we had already moved to, to Washington. I always wanted to make an impact in people's lives. I know that, you know, when I moved to Washington Heights with my family, uh, you know, after getting, frankly, after getting burned out of two separate apartments in the South Bronx, I, I wanted to be a psychologist, but, but realized uh, that, you know, you know, and, and I realized this while I was doing uh, community empowerment work in Washington Heights, uh, that, that really I derived value and meaning from, from helping and working with my community in Washington Heights. You know, uh, an immigrant community that was immigrating uh, in, in those in the early 70s and really did not have uh, an infrastructure or service uh, uh, you know, English as a second language or citizenship class really had no mechanism to integrate itself uh, to the main uh, society. So I, I thought, you know, I, I can do this. And there was a group of young folks like, you know, Congressman Espaillat, who was not Congressman then, he was just a kid like me, uh, you know, Commissioner Guillermo Linares, you know, just a bunch of young kids uh, who decided to create, you know, organizations to serve the community, to, you know, build that social service infrastructure that was so badly needed uh, in our community. I want to follow up on that in a second, but, but uh, first, did you say you were burned out of two apartments? I, I was, you know, in those days, the South, the South Bronx was a tough place, you know, and, uh, remember, uh, Jimmy Carter, you know, was brought to the Bronx and they, everybody talked about the South Bronx burning. Uh, well, they meant it literally. So, so we got burned out of one apartment. 
uh, and and got burned out of another. That's when we realized, uh, you know, I had already applied, decided to go to Columbia College, so we decided to move uh, to Washington Heights in 74, uh, 75. So you understood the plight of the underdog, and is that why getting out of law school with a prestigious degree, rather than going to work for one of the silk stocking firms uh, in Midtown, you went to the Legal Aid Society where you were probably not making as much money as you would have made? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, because I was so heavily involved in community empowerment, uh, you, you know, at least during my college days, I, I realized, you know, the important role that lawyers play in our society under the rule of law. I, I realized early that, that lawyers, not psychologists, play a key role in making people's lives better. Not that I have anything against psychologists, obviously they do too, but there was something that just appealed to me uh, and I wanted to become a lawyer. Uh, you know, frankly, I, I, I decided to be a public interest lawyer because during those tough times in the South Bronx, it was the, I not only wanted to be a public interest lawyer, I wanted to work in the South Bronx office of the Legal Aid Society Civil Division. That is the office that helped my family uh, during one of those tough times when we got burned out of an apartment, my father lost his job, we were having difficulty paying the rent. And it was that office who, who helped us. He was actually a lawyer uh, who later became a Supreme Court Justice, uh, Robert Lippman. Uh, Bob Lippman represented us in housing court uh, and it was then that I decided, um, you know, this is something that I really want to do. This is how I want to pay it forward. Uh, and it's something that, you know, that, that uh, appealed to me to be able to impact people's lives the same way that Bob and the Legal Aid Society impacted my life. Uh, so I chose to work in that particular office. So you had a uh, a personal experience as well as an immigrant experience that you brought to the profession and the bench. What does that experience bring to the profession and the bench? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I you know, my, my, I think my immigrant experience uh, informs who I am and my worldview, uh, which I think is what I bring to the bench. I mean, when I talk about diversity, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I find appealing about diversity, the fact that so many different views are at the table. Uh, I, I, I think that your experience and your worldview uh, acts as a lens through which you view the world, you know, through which you examine the facts that are brought to you in the context of litigation. Uh, and, and frankly, that allows you to dispense justice. Uh, of course, you know, my experience and a judge's experience uh, should be constrained by, by precedent and, and reasons. Uh, any judge who tells you, and I know this question always gets asked of me, but any judge who tells you that they cannot, uh, that they can leave behind what brought them to the bench in the first place, in the first place, it, it, it's not really self-examining uh, uh, or simply just doesn't understand that who we are in our worldview uh, is impacted by our experiences and what we do. We, we know sep we're no different than any other human being uh, in that sense. Well, don't, isn't that something we want? I mean, otherwise, basically, you could take the law and the facts and plug them into a computer and come out with a result, right? Exactly right, exactly right, which is, you know, and frankly, I think that the best work product uh, is a work product that uh, is the outcome of a, of a diverse bench, not just diverse in terms of race and gender, although that does give you a lens through which to examine what's in front of you, but geographic diversity. I mean, I know now as a, a PJ in the first department, I have experiences uh, at the administrative board and discussing issues with uh, Jerry Whalen and, and Beth, you know, and sometimes uh, you don't realize uh, the impact that a rural environment, for example, will have in how you view the issue, uh, certainly how I will view the issue uh, in the mid in Midtown Manhattan. <laughs> where certainly, I Justice Gary grew up in a, on a dairy farm, I believe. 
Exactly, exactly. Consider, right. Considerably different experience than yours. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Let's, let's pivot to the court, if we could. Uh, the first department, just a, a bird's eye view. What is it? Where is it? And what does it do? Yeah, well, it's, it's a great court. You know, we are located in Midtown Manhattan, uh, 25th Street and Madison. Um, it was created uh, by the New York State Constitution back in 1894. Um, it, it is one of the four intermediate appellate court. Uh, and, and we hold jurisdiction over uh, the Bronx, the counties of the Bronx and the county of New York uh, or Manhattan. So appeals to us are uh, as a right in civil and criminal matters. Um, and of course, as a branch of the Supreme Court, the appellate division has very broad powers uh, to review questions of law uh, and fact uh, and to make new findings of fact even. Uh, so very powerful entity. There's of course only one appellate division, but four departments. How is yours, do you think, unique from the other three? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Yes, great questions, John. It, it, it's, uh, I mean, I think it is unique. The, the first appointment is unique in that it really is a, a residential court handling, you know, unique number of cases. So co complex commercial cases uh, is one of our, you know, sort of unique aspect of our inventory. Um, and, and it's... It, you know, I think it's equal or superior to, to a lot of all the courts, you know, London, Delaware. Uh, there are now more commercial cases filed, for example, in the commercial division in Manhattan, Supreme Court, and then appealed to us in the first department than any other court, including the Southern District of New York uh, and any other appellate court in the country. So, so the, the appellate division first department is the forum of choice in most commercial matters these days. Hmm. Now, how many judges do you have assigned to the court? Well, I, currently we have uh, uh, 20 justices certified to the Appellate Division First Department, but we currently have two vacancies. Hmm. So you're a little shorthanded. Now, last year your judges heard about 1,400 oral arguments, decided 5,500 motions, um, adjudicated 3,776 cases, admitted nearly 2,700 employee, uh, attorneys to the practice of law, um, decided 275 attorney discipline matters. Um, with that volume of cases, is it possible to have a hot bench, a, a, a bench where the judges are um, know what the issues are in a given case before they hear the arguments, and or to really have a a spirited give and take with the attorneys. Well, I mean, the answer is absolutely. In fact, uh, that is our uh, reputation in the first department, uh, which I think is really is a testament uh, to the industriousness uh, of appellate division first department justices. Uh, we decided, you know, almost 3,200 cases last year in 2019. Uh, we currently, as of today, as of this interview, we have two pending appeals. Uh, which we should be able to get done uh, in short time. Uh, so, you know, we average uh, in the first department about 29.7 days from oral argument to publication. Uh, so, you know, we are, our tradition is to be well prepared for oral argument. Uh, you know, again, that is- Let me cut you off a second. How many days from argument to- 29.7 days. One of the beauties- oh, That's incredible. Yeah, one of the beauties of, of having uh, spent uh, my last three, my first three years as PJ to bring the court into the 21st century is that we now have a case management system that allows me to generate pretty much any kind of report that I want. You know, how many cases, criminal, civil, family, surrogate, within civil, how many of them are co commercial cases, how many of them are other type of cases. So I'm able to generate that. Uh, of course, keep track of how long uh, the cases take throughout our process. And I'm proud to say that, 
you know, not very many, if any, appellate courts can can uh, can boast about a turnaround time frame uh, as of twenty nine point days uh, as we have. Uh, in the that, first that, that 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 is impressive. Now, with the volume of cases that you have, is it practical for the court to um, uh, have what you might call teaching moments, or is it primarily resolve a dispute so people can get on with their lives, or is it a mix of both? Yeah, it, it's a mixture mixture of both. I mean, our primary goal, of course, is is to address and resolve the dispute that's before us. Uh, but, but we also have other responsibilities beyond correcting errors and providing guidance uh, to trial courts. Uh, we, we understand that uh, an overwhelming majority of our decisions are final and they don't get appealed or heard by the Court of Appeals. So I think that that gives us an obligation to dispense justice and often make legal policy choices until matters are clarified by the Court of Appeals. A again, with few exceptions, appeals to the Court of Appeals are by, per by permission only. You need leave uh, in order to go to the Court of Appeals. People can appeal, litigants can appeal to us as long as they agree as of right. Uh, so um, th th there is reason why we have been vested uh, with the, bo you know, the broad powers that I pointed out before uh, to review questions of law and fact and, and frankly to make new findings of fact if that is what is necessary. As you know, we also uh, have this uh, interest of justice jurisdiction, uh, which certainly allows us when we need to, and we use it sparingly, uh, to go beyond simply correcting errors uh, to the ultimate goal of achieving justice in that particular case. That segues into another uh, a question I had. Um, normally, a case can only get to the Court of Appeals with the permission of the Court of Appeals. Um, however, it's also possible for the appellate division to refer a case or to grant leave so a case gets there, basically for the appellate division to force the Court of Appeals to take a case. This chief judge and all of them in my memory have not been particularly fond of that practice. What are the circumstances when your court will, will essentially um, foist a case onto the Court of Appeals rather than let them decide whether they want it or not? <laughs> that, I'm, I'm going to get you in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> you, you are getting me in trouble. Uh, it, it's, um, you know, obviously we we are, uh, you know, let, let me think about that answer. It, it, it's every court, including the Court of Appeals, wants the prerogative of controlling their own calendar. Uh, every court wants to be able to control their own calendar. I, I would love to be able to do that a little more, but as you know, when you get appeal as a yeah. right, you get what comes in. Uh, the Court of Appeals is really, you, you reach it by permission and only on very limited types of cases, issues of law uh, and no matters that are final. Um, it, you know, however, you know, statutes uh, and part of the Constitution have given appellate divisions the power to refer a matter to the Court of Appeals when we feel that it needs resolution. Uh, so, so, and we don't hesitate to do that. Understanding that is something that we need to use parallelly. You know, when you have two judges at the appellate division dissenting uh, and, and writing, you know, a 20, 30 page dissent explaining why we should, they should, we should rule, the majority should really rule in the way that, that the dissent sees it. That, that is a matter that I think requires some scrutiny by the Court of Appeals. I think that that was sort of the, the wisdom of the legislature in, in giving us the power to do that. Uh, frankly, I think it, it is the right decision. You know, if you have a panel of five judges uh, that cannot agree uh, on a particular matter because it involves issue, issues of public policy or involves a particular set of issues that requires uh, interpretation by the higher court, 
uh, we, you know, we don't hesitate to go ahead and, and send those up. How is it decided if there's just going to be a, a terse order, um, a procurium, a procurium opinion, um, a signed opinion, a written opinion? How, how is that all decided? With, with the volume, obviously you cannot write a written opinion in every case, and, and, I'm, and I'm certain every case doesn't work. <coughs> But how do you make that, dis- that determination? Uh, oh, well, that, that's a decision that really is made uh, by the randomly assigned judge. You know, he or she has the discretion uh, to decide whether, or sometimes it's urged by, by the majority or by the panel, you know, that issue requires a little more clarification or, or a little more expansion or the suggested writing doesn't quite uh, bring forth uh, the kind of clarity that we think is necessary for the trial court. So that judge has the discretion to what we call hold the case, um, hold the case and come up with a more extensive writing or even assign opinion, uh, which will then be brought before the, the panel of judges uh, to, to ultimately agree or disagree with it. Obviously, if you disagree, you can respond in the form of a dissent uh, to that writing. Now, I would imagine that uh, in conference, there are some rather spirited arguments. Um, And so how do you, as a presiding justice, um, prevent intelligent, principled, probably opinionated people um, from taking personal offense or allowing professional disagreements to devolve into personal animosities, which might be the unnatural occurrence in, in, yeah. in a pandemic. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I personally, and this is something that I've written about uh, extensively, I, I mean, I believe that dissents are very important. Uh, I, I think that dissents help to sharpen the issues uh, and often improve uh, the quality of the decisions to be issued by the court. I, 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 you often hear me say that uh, my best writing is usually done when there is an opponent. <laughs> so the, the sense, I, I think, also serve to clarify the issues for the Court of Appeals and for the public. Uh, I think, frankly, I, I think great dissents sometimes become the majority opinion uh, if they are able to carry the majority. Sometimes it takes a few years for that to take place, uh, but often a, a great dissent uh, so moves the majority or so moves the, the public debate that uh, ultimately becomes a, a majority opinion. Um, now, you, you, don't, you don't dissent every time that you disagree. <laughs> it's important to understand that. I think, it, 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 you know, it depends on the nature of the disagreement. I think small disagreements can often be accommodated by a good writing, uh, it, you know. So, and that happens uh, more often than, than we like uh, to think. Um, but when it is a significant disagreement, uh, for example, if the majority, uh, and as in, the, as in uh, one of my cases, if the majority is trying to curtail the power of the chief administrative judge and the chief judge to create problem-solving courts, then, then all bets are off. And, and, you know, in that case, Correa, you know, I was a sole dissent. I think it was trying to, uh, you know, curtail the power of the chief administrative judge I, and, as importantly, limit the power of a Supreme Court justice to deal with a unindicted uh, misdemeanors. Uh, so... That is something that ultimately I dissented by myself, which is unusual. Usually you want another colleague to come along with you. Uh, But I dissented by myself. It was ultimately, my dissent was ultimately adopted uh, by the Court of Appeals. uh, And we were able to preserve problem-solving courts, including a domestic violent courts that that play such a key role uh, within the state judiciary. Sometimes when I read U.S. Supreme Court decisions, I think, yikes, these people hate each other. And I, I, <laughs> I do not 
get that sense reading your opinions. I, I get the sense you guys, your, your court, your judges can disagree without being disagreeable, as Judge Lippman used to like to put it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I encourage my judges, you know, to express themselves clearly on cases, but, but never make it personal. You know, I, I do remind them, uh, and I think that they understand, that, that the person on the other side of your position this week will be your ally the following week on a different case. So, you know, while I, you know, encourage them to be clear and disagree when they need to, it is important to understand uh, that these are colleagues. You, you do your best not to make it personal. Uh, you know, we, th there are a lot of systems that I, that we have at the appellate division uh, to make sure that the, that the, uh, the, the tension that sometimes is created by the voluminous work that we do um, gets dissipated somewhat. You know, we generally eat together. I mean, one of the advantages of being a, 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 a residential court, as I mentioned to you before, is that my judges have uh, the only one chamber, and the chambers are in the courthouse at 25th Street. The other departments, second, third, and fourth, where the judges are more geographically uh, dispersed. So they don't have the ability that we have to break bread together and socialize and find out how our children and grandchildren are doing. Uh, it's an important thing. I mean, sometimes people underestimate it, but it's really important because it, it is difficult to be disagreeable, let's say, with a judge, uh, a judge's opposing view when you just finish breaking bread with that judge, you know? So, so it's, you know, those social gatherings are really an important tool uh, for us to continue to work together uh, in, in that number of cases. How are the panels created? And is there a conscious effort to ensure that the judges at any particular panel, um, that, that, that the judges get a chance to work with the other judges? You know, I mean, you, 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 you could assign the same, four judge panels all the time, then you'd have groups of, four, groups of four all over the place doing things. But is there, a, is there an effort to, for them to, to rotate that? It, it, it is. You know, the, the calendar itself, uh, before we assign the cases to each panel, the panels are, are created a month and a half before. And, and, and one of the things that we do, uh, the clerk usually prepares uh, the, the panel one of the goals is to make sure that every judge gets an opportunity to sit with all of their colleagues. So we have 18 judges by the end of the calendar year. Uh, and as you know, we have a 10 month uh, calendar year. Um, it, it, each judge has already sat with every one of his or her colleagues. And I think that it's important. I think it's one of the uh, great part of being involved in a, in a court like the appellate division first department. I would imagine otherwise there'd be a danger of creating cliques. That, that, that's right. That's right. It, it, you know, it, it's, and you don't get to see, I mean, it, you don't get to see and interact with all the judges and how they view uh, particular cases. And you're right. It does have, you know, negative consequences to, for you as a judge to only see a portion of your colleagues. That's not good for them, it's not good for the court, it's not good for the litigants that come before the court. Mm -hmm. And the Court of Appeals, of course, does not have that problem. There are seven judges who sit on every case. That, that, they don't, that's right, that's mm -hmm. right. But remember, the Court of Appeals, it, you know, they're making really difficult, tough policy choices uh, on a much smaller number of cases. I mean, sure. as we have, you know, 3,200 uh, appeals to the first department, we have a couple of hundred uh, to the Court of Appeals. So it's a, sort of a different way of, of, of approaching uh, the work. Now your job is half or maybe more than half uh, administrative and as a presiding justice, you're a member of the administrative board, which includes the four PJs and uh, the chief judge. Um, what does that work entail, and, and how much how much uh, time does that take working doing your doing your work with the administrative board? Uh, it, it, it's you know it, it takes 
uh, more times than I thought when I was an associate and I applied to be the PJ. I mean, the, the, be careful the, what you wish for, right? <laughs> the, 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 I mean, the board meets monthly, uh, uh, and as you pointed out, you know, the, the, the administrative board uh, uh, establishes state, statewide uh, standards and policies. Uh, you know, they, they range from minor changes to the rules of, say, the commercial division, uh, to changes on the rules of ethics that apply uh, or, or govern the conduct of lawyers. Uh, so it, it's a lot. I mean, for example, you know, just recently uh, we enacted uh, what has been characterized as, as the humanitarian exception, uh, which importantly uh, now allows lawyers in, on this, in certain circumstances to provide financial assistance to litigation clients, you know, as you know, there were ethical impediments to a lawyer giving, you know, food or transportation uh, or a coat to a client if they see that that coat is really not protecting him or her. Sometimes, I mean, and you know, this is something close to my heart as a former legal aid lawyer, uh, turning in charge of a, 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 you know, a poverty lawyer for a long time. You know, sometimes you see clients coming in, you can see that they haven't eaten in a couple of days. You see that, you know, their child that they brought with them is wearing a flimsy coat, uh, coat in, you know, 20 degree weather. So, you know, very little that we can do ethically under those circumstances. Now this humanitarian exception allows that lawyer to, you know, use resources that, not resources that have been allocated to do the legal work, but resources that have been obtained precisely to address uh, those issues. You know, maybe a, a client cannot come into uh, the office when you want him to. It's okay to give them a metro car. Uh, you know, you, you know, you see they're hungry. It's okay to, you know, get them a meal, that kind of thing. That, you know, really non-controversial as far as I'm concerned. So it sounds like um, in the context of this whole conversation, the four departments are necessary the four regional departments are necessary because they understand um, the nature of uh, their geography. And, and as you mentioned before, um, you have the bulk of the commercial cases. Right. And uh, I bet uh, Justice Gary in the third department hears a whole lot more uh, farm cases. Yeah, that's right. It sounds like the administrative board is, is the one that kind of looks back and says, well, what, what should everybody do consistently administratively? That's right. And I mean, and the chief, I mean, you know, to her credit, you know, Chief Judge DeFiori has been wonderful about doing, encouraging us to do everything that we can to create uniformity. Because it, the other side of that is that you don't want, you know, a litigant to come into the first department and then has to go to the third department and feels like he's in a different country. You know, you want some uniformity. Also, while understanding that there are local customs and local practices, you know, that, that, that have been carved out, actually, out of the uniform uh, rules that we've created. So I think it's a wonderful thing. Uniformity when we need to be uniform, but with enough flexibility to allow uh, for some customs in the three other uh, departments of the appellate division. Let's say there is an attorney watching this who's about to argue before the first department for the first time, what is your advice? What should she do and what should she not do? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I, I mean, if you're gonna appear in the first department, my best advice is to please be prepared. You know, you're gonna encounter a hot bench who has read the record, who has read the briefs, who is intimately familiar with the facts of your case. I mean, we work hard in the first department uh, to know the cases as well as the litigant. And my advice is do not allow a judge to know more about your case than you. <laughs> so, you know, if you see the archives of oral arguments in the first department, you notice the heavy interaction between the judges and the litigants and the intricate questions that are asked of those, you know, in those cases. Um, 
you know, the, the, the second advice will be, you know, your main job as an advocate is to convince the judge of the merits of your position. So one primary way to achieve that is to make sure that you answer the questions that are troubling the judge. I know that sometimes litigants come in, they have their, their libretto, you know, they have their own presentation and they want to address issue one, two, and three. But it may be that the judge is already convinced with issue one and two and she wants to focus on that third issue. That's a real thorny issue. So she's asking you questions. Please answer those questions. The great advocates understand the importance of doing that because you're basically dealing with any concerns that the judge may have uh, before she rules in your favor. Uh, and, and my third advice, and this is something that I always uh, tell uh, folks um, uh, at, at forums like this, for example, is to please not only be precise, but be honest. Uh, don't get cute uh, when you don't know the answer to a question. Uh, and, and I strongly advise you uh, not to misstate or obscure the facts uh, or the law. Uh, frankly, I tell you, it'll never help you. Uh, we know already the cases uh, that, are, you know, that, that, that constrain us, that, that, that control that particular case. Uh, so for you to go, you know, not cite to, to cases that oppose your position and explain it and maybe distinguish uh, those cases, I don't think uh, is, is going to help you. And, and frankly, it, it, you know, what it does, it creates a reputation, not just to the judges, but to the general community that will carry into the future and frankly, in, into all the cases in which you appear before the court. So have a reputation for straightforwardness and honesty. That's always my advice. That, that's great advice. Now, what is your advice to the trial judges? What, what, should, what should they know that they fully understand and what should they know about the record on appeal and how it's, how it's uh, utilized and created? Yeah, that, that, that's a tough one. That's a <laughs> tough one. I mean, the, the, one, the one advice that I will give them is that getting reversed is not personal, <laughs> it, 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 nor, nor is it a reflection of the industriousness of, of that judge uh, that is being reversed. Uh, in, in fact, I, it, my personal belief is that a, a judge who doesn't get reversed is often a judge who doesn't take chances or goes the extra yard to achieve justice. Uh, you know, my advice is work hard, and would you disagree with our precedent, you know, be candid about the nature of the disagreement uh, and, and tell us why uh, you think that you should be allowed to disregard that precedent. Uh, so, so we can sometimes be convinced by trial judges that a particular approach is the best way to proceed in, in that particular case. Just be straightforward. Be honest about the position. Don't try to, you know, uh, tell us what you're thinking is. The more you give us, the more in a position we are to be convinced by your argument. Uh, don't be um, cryptic, I guess is the word. Uh, you know, be generous in your analysis uh, in that particular case. Mm. So it sounds like the message to both uh, litigators and uh, judges is uh, be prepared and, and give you the materials that you need to do what you need to do. Exactly right. Exactly right. Judge, thank you so much for that uh, candid and, uh, and uh, illuminating discussion. And uh, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate this interview. One of the most fun ones I've had in the COVID <laughs> era. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that.